reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus 20 through 22, the Ten Commandments. We're going to see in chapter 20 how God gives the Ten Commandments to Israel. Chapter 21, he gives laws concerning injury. And then in chapter 22, he gives laws concerning morality. We're going to see these Ten Commandments govern our lives in every way possible. Uh, They are probably the most important verses, the most well-known verses in all the Bible. We're going to break it down and see what God has for us in this rich study that he gives us in the Ten Commandments. Father, we ask you to help us to really be open now to seeing this by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to really understand what you have for us and be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. God has taken Israel out of bondage. They were in Egypt for 430 years, and they were suffering. They were being treated as slaves, and God set them free through Moses, their deliverer. They went through the Red Sea, which parted, and they walked over on dry land. And instead of taking the 14-day journey right up the Mediterranean coastline to Uh, Israel, their eventual home. Uh, God knew that 14 days uh, would not be enough time for them to be ready to handle the giants, the warriors of the Philistines. And so he needed to have time to reveal who he was and what he was able to do for them and what he wanted them to do for him. So he had another plan that would take not 14 days, but two years. And it begins by taking them down into Mount Sinai, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, right to the bottom of that uh, peninsula, and uh, putting Moses up on the mountain. God is going to reveal who he is and what he has done for his people and what he expects from them. It's important for us to realize that uh, God wants to, first of all, identify who he is to us, what he has done for us, and then what he expects from us. We need to remember that, especially as we are going out and talking to people and we start to point our fingers and say, you've got to give this lifestyle up. You've got to stop doing that. No, don't do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to tell them what God has done for them through Jesus Christ by giving Jesus to them as their sin bearer, as their their God, and as their great love. Once you introduce Jesus to them, he then will send the Holy Spirit to come in and clean them up. And by the way, clean us up as well. All right, they're now down in Mount Sinai, and God is going to give them the law, the Ten Commandments. I want to make, just by way of reference, I want to make this a little bit easier for us to understand. We have Ten Commandments, and then we have a number of laws which follow that, Uh, It's been numbered at a total of 613 laws, enough to cross a rabbi's eyes any time. How do you distinguish what's going on? It's really very simple, and I like to break things down in a very simple way. The Ten Commandments are God's law. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationship with fellow man. First four towards God, last six towards man. They can be summarized, as Jesus said, with the word love. When the young lawyer came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's the first. And the second, he said, is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So therefore, he said, in this, all of the law is summarized. So the Ten Commandments are broken down into loving God, the first four commandments, 
and loving your neighbor, the last six. And that can be summarized by one word, as the Beatles said, all they sang, all you need is love, right? Love summarizes all of the law. What about the others? Jerry, there were 613. You just mentioned 10. That leaves what, 603 more? They are simply, and not to, not to denigrate them, they are simply an example or an amplification of those 10 commandments. So that makes it easier. <clears throat> we keep the focus on the Ten Commandments, but they're illustrated and summarized by all the 603, and that'll make it a little bit easier. Otherwise, you can't see the forest for the trees. You're, you're just so confused. So let's look at it from that point of view. And of those Ten Commandments, nine of them are for us today, literally, as we see it here. One was for Israel. It is not carried over for us in its literal form, and that's the Sabbath. That's where the church gets confused. The Sabbath is not for the church. The church did not observe the Sabbath, literally. They observed the resurrection the first day of the week on Sunday. The Hebrew, the Jews today still uh, celebrate the Sabbath, the seventh day, which is Saturday. Seventh day Adventists do as well. But we are going to see that we do celebrate the Sabbath in a very special and more important way, the way that it was always intended for God to illustrate to us. We'll talk about that in a minute. Remember, this all points to Jesus Christ. All right, chapter 20, verse 1. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he's telling who he is. God always starts with who he is. When you and I share him with others, tell them who he is. Don't say give up your homosexuality, stop having abortions, stop cheating, stop lying. Don't no, Tell them who God is. Start with that. He's the Lord your God. And then what did he do for you? He brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Jesus wants to bring you and me out of our Egypt, our old nature our old life of sin, self, <clears throat> and Satan. And so Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. And now that you know who he is and what he has done, let's talk about what we are to do for him. First of all, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. He's going to deal with that every day in our lives as we make gods of ourselves, gods of our jobs, gods of our pride, of our sex, of this or that. No other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness, anything that is in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Some people say you can't do a painting, you can't do a, a this or that. That's not what he's saying. There's no harm in having a painting of Jesus, uh, but the important thing is the next verse. You don't make that image, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. So you don't make an image to bow down and serve it. And yes, as you go out the door, you're going to see a beautiful uh, print of Jesus holding a lamb against his breast. A beautiful picture of how Jesus loves us. That's not breaking the commandment. But if I go and say, I have to touch that picture every day, that's my identity. That's my uh, Linus blanket, so to speak. That's my comfort. It becomes a God. That's wrong. We cannot make that image and bow down to it because God says he is the only one. You'll have no other gods before me. Don't make any kind of an image and make that your God. And so he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Elsewhere, he says that he is not going to blame the children for the sins of the fathers, and he doesn't. He is going to hold accountable the one who has done wrong. But what he's saying here is that there is such a strong pull from generation to generation, uh, nature and nurture, 
When uh, the father doesn't serve the Lord, he doesn't take the kids to Sunday school, doesn't do devotions with them, they're not likely to serve the Lord. And so through uh, that nurture, they're not going to uh, have it. There can be a nature in the sense of a, of a genetic, I can't say a genetic predisposition, but there is a familiar spirit component where if one generation doesn't seem to serve another. Uh, I've seen it in our families. Uh, that there's, there's one strain of family here where nobody has served the Lord. Nobody whatsoever. How does that happen? Well, God's not making them not serve, but they pass it on themselves. Sin tends to spread from generation to generation. On the other hand, mercy. My great-great-grandfather was a Cumberland Presbyterian pastor uh, of Scottish, uh, of Scots-Irish heritage down in Tennessee. And uh, I, I read his um, autobiography, his memoirs, and in there, he has a prayer for succeeding generations. And every generation that uh, came from him uh, loved the Lord and served the Lord. He had a son who, uh, his name was Allison Templeton, and he had a son whose name was Jerome Templeton. He became a lawyer. I think he was a judge, but he was a godly man, and he loved the Lord. And then he had a son whose name was Clarence Allison Templeton, my grandfather. And he was a lawyer and a judge and a Bible a Sunday school teacher, and he served the Lord. And then he had a son named Jerome Templeton, not much imagination. And uh, Jerome Templeton was my father. And he was a, an elder in the Presbyterian Church in Knoxville and uh, was a, uh, loved the, the Bible. They said that he knew the Bible better than any pastor that they knew. And then uh, he had two sons. Uh, I was Clarence Allison Templeton II, and um, naturally I would become a lawyer and a Bible teacher, and my brother uh, was, was Jerome Templeton, naturally, we called him Casey, and uh, he also went on to seminary and became an evangelist. So there's something about praying for succeeding generations and then giving them the opportunity to serve uh, the Lord as well. So uh, pray for your offspring, pray for your children, for your grandchildren. So the first commandment, no other gods before God. Number two, don't make any image and bow down to it. Uh, I'm jealous. Number uh, Verse uh, seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does that word vain mean? Empty. So don't take it in vain. It doesn't mean to swear. It means just meaningless. I love you, Lord. And I'm not thinking of you. I'm thinking about going to Hawaii and putting my feet in the sand. And we can do that. We go, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And your mind is someplace else. That's vain. That's empty. It's like my, my, my wife, Kelly. Kelly, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Or I just send emojis, emojis, emojis. She wants to know that I mean it, that it's real, and it is real. I love you, honey. So God says, don't do it in vain. Don't make it empty. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So mean it. Don't speak of him lightly. And certainly don't curse. Uh, but, that, that, but vain means it's empty. You have no real meaning. Oh, I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. Do you really mean it? And then the fourth commandment, uh, commandment which is the one that is not kept by the church. Remember the Sabbath day. When I say the church, I mean the early church. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work. That means customary, regular, go to your job work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested, underline that word, rested, the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the fourth one, and that's the one that's not brought into the New Testament in terms of the literal sixth or seventh day rest. That was a covenant that God had with Israel. Why did he want them to have that day off? Well, it was not really a day off. It was a day off from work, your customary work. But it was to be a day of trust, a day of leaning on the Lord, of worshiping him, of trusting him that if I don't go to my job today, he will provide for me as I put him first. 
It became a reminder to put God first, lean on him, just as he did the manna. Remember how he gave the manna to them every day, except uh, on the, the fifth, the sixth day, he rained down two days so they wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. Well, the church gets into the Sabbath, and we call it uh, Sunday, the Sabbath rest, which of course that's you know, it's a figure of speech, but Sabbath means, uh, it really means the rest day, and it's to be the seventh day. It's to be Saturday. Um, but the church uh, has gotten to see it as Sunday. That's fine to call it whatever day you want to. Call it Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, rest is good. The, one of the values of the rest is we do need a day off uh, to do other things. So the, but the most important thing is take that time off and give it to the Lord. Somehow celebrate Him. Back when I was young, the people used to go to church on Sundays, and um, they would, uh, the stores were closed. Remember that? You couldn't go in to the stores, but that's no longer the case. Uh, now we have stores open. We have kids doing baseball practice and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so I'm not being critical of that, but that's just the way it is. Uh, things have changed. But the point is about the Sabbath. It was meant to point us to our rest. Hebrews chapter 4 gives us the answer. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that the Sabbath rest speaks of Jesus Christ, who is our rest. In Hebrews chapter 4 in the New Testament, you don't need to turn to it, in verse 9, it says, There remains a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his, capital H, he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. So Israel would cease from their works on the seventh day. For us, we are to cease from our works every day, all day, seven days a week, meaning we are not to try to please God by our works. We are not righteous. None are righteous, the Bible says, not one. But we please God by resting in Jesus. He's talking in this passage about the fact that Israel didn't get its rest when they went into Canaan because the real rest comes from Jesus Christ. So how do I observe the Sabbath? By not trying to please God with my works <clears throat> and not trying to do God's work on my own. God wants me to share the faith of Jesus Christ, I'll determine that program. No, I will not. I will do his works on my own. No, I will not. I will say, Lord, Jesus has paid the price for my sins. I rest in him as my satisfaction. Now, whatever work I do for you, please direct it. It must be directed by you and for you and for your glory. It means rest in him. Stop trying to do it on your own. That's the ultimate meaning of the Sabbath rest. And the, the early church knew that. That's why they did not meet on Sunday, Saturday. They met on Sundays, and Sunday was celebrating the, the resurrection. There are churches today that meet on Saturdays, and I don't criticize that, uh, or it's Sundays. But uh, I, I do think, uh, once I asked the congregation, I felt like sleeping in. I said, do you think we ought to skip Sunday and do Saturday afternoon? They said, no. It's, it's the honoring the Lord, his resurrection. Not that it's the Sabbath, but that it's celebrating the resurrection, which was on Sunday. That's the reason the church really meets and should meet on a Sunday. Meet on Saturdays as well if you want to. But uh, Sunday is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So those are the first four of the commandments. And remember when we talked about love, Jesus said the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Look at verse 3. First of all, you have no other gods before me. That's loving him. Number four, you don't, verse four, no carved image, don't bow down to it. I'm jealous. Again, you're loving him. He's first and only. And then uh, you're going to uh, number seven, you're not going to take his name in vain. Verse seven, uh, that's loving him as well. And then you're resting in him, you're trusting in him to meet your needs. That's loving God. The second is like it, Jesus said. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let's see how that works out. So we have the first four commandments. Now let's get on with the fifth one. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. 
Honor your father and your mother. Show them respect. Show them obedience. And why will your days be long? Many people leave this earth suddenly and uh, before their time because they never learned how to submit. God wants us to learn, to, to learn how to submit. And we start that with our parents. Even before we understand who God is, we understand through submission to mommy and daddy soon after we come out of the womb. So we submit. If we don't learn that lesson, you don't learn it from mom and dad, don't learn it from the teachers in school, the coach, the sergeant in the army, you're going to learn it from the warden in prison. If you don't learn it from him, there's always that tendency to go too soon. One of the dear men that was on staff with us years ago was a fine, fine fella. Had gotten out of prison, was trying to uh, get rid of the drug habit, and uh, he was, uh, he, I, he's a great fellow, but he had trouble in submission. And he was married, had a child, and one day went down towards Washington, D.C. For some reason, didn't tell his wife why. Next thing I know, she's flying down there. She's in the funeral parlor asking for me to pray as she lays hands on him to be raised from the dead. I was kind of shocked. I did pray, but he didn't come back there. What happened was he we don't know the exact details, but he got back into that lifestyle, was trying to collect a debt uh, of drugs or what have you. Somebody pulled a knife on him, and that was it. So if you want to honor your parents, uh, it's a good way to start to learn to submit to God, and your days will be long upon this earth. We like to tell our kids that, don't we, Kelly, that uh, honor your mom and your dad, not only the stepdad, but honor your mother that your days may be long upon this earth. All right, the next commandment, you shall not murder. Remember, we're loving our neighbor, right? So if you are loving mom and dad, you're showing love towards your neighbor. You're not murdering, you're loving your neighbor. You shall not commit adultery, you're loving your neighbor. Think about adultery for a minute. Adultery can be uh, sex with somebody outside of a marriage, but also it can be just fornication with two unmarried people. Uh, it seems like a lot of fun, it seems like a great thing, but it's not loving. It's not loving. How many people have felt guilt uh, for what they did? If you really love somebody, you're going to do it God's way. You're going to be, be married, and you're going to then be able to enjoy that pleasure uh, within the bonds of matrimony. But when you do it outside of marriage, I've counseled too many people, been around too long to realize it, it's, it's fun for the moment. And then after that, guilt and all sorts of things set in. That's not love. You shall not steal. That's pretty obvious. That's not loving. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not going to lie uh, in testimony about what that person did or said. That's not loving. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Uh, in other words, you're not going to say, I wish I had that house, and begin to really want to, to have that. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. That's pretty obvious. Nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that's your neighbor's. When you're coveting, you're saying, I don't have that, I wish I had that, I want that. That's not loving towards your neighbor. That's not loving towards God. You're saying to God, you haven't done a good job in meeting my needs. You haven't done a good job in meeting my needs. And so uh, there's always somebody who has something that you wish you had. And uh, then if you ever had what he had, you might wish you hadn't. Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side, but it still has to be cut and there could be a lot of weeds in there too. In any event, those are the Ten Commandments. First four towards God, love God. Last six towards your neighbor, love your neighbor. All summarized by love. Now, that is the law. That's it. If you never had time to learn anything more, you have it. If you didn't have time to look at the 603 laws on top of that, you'd still have the essence. It's love. Loving God, loving your neighbor, couldn't be any simpler than that. But we need examples. We need illustrations. My wife told me this morning when she was teaching a class in nursing, if I can just share this without details, uh, a couple of the students, she teaches uh, mental health in the uh, local uh, uh, nursing school, and uh, a couple of the more feisty, complaining types were saying to each other, I don't know why she has all those illustrations of, uh, of her experience of working with mental health at the local hospital here. We just want to get down to the books and get the answers and be able to get out. 
and Kelly is sharing examples of the principles of mental health for nursing. What I'm doing with my little stories about my lineage or this or that is, uh, even though I'm old, I'm not an old man who's beginning to wander in his thinking, they're to give examples. And so they become illustrations. My mother used to say, give windows of explanation. So God's saying, these are the laws, but you need examples. I went to law school, as you probably know, for three years and then practiced law for 14 years. And in law school, we read cases, examples of what the law is. Now, all those laws in law school, in the practice of law, are about love or a lack of love, about love towards fellow man, not so much about love towards God. Some cases get to the Supreme Court about the Ten Commandments or prayer in school, things like that. But a lot of it's love or lack of love towards your neighbor. Examples and cases that go on all over the world are examples of playing out these Ten Commandments. So we're going to get into some of these examples because you get a better idea with examples and amplification. Now, verse 18 all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Uh, so God was certainly showing himself in a very powerful way. He was showing how serious he is. And uh, don't presume upon me. Uh, you are to treat me with respect and with honor. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. So they're afraid of God at this point, And that's not the worst thing. Um, parents have to decide as they're raising children, do I want to be their best friend? My mother would say to us when we didn't like what she was saying or doing, I'm not your best friend. I'm not running a popularity contest. I'm trying to raise good, responsible children. So as a pastor, I try to be kind and nice, but there may be a time when I have to make that choice. Am I trying to be a BFF, as they say, a best friend, or uh, tell them what they need to hear? And so God is saying, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. Moses said to the people, don't, for, don't be afraid, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. That his fear is before you that you may not sin. That's why he has this fear. Well, some of the commentators say, Jerry, it's not fear. God is loving. He's Jesus, meek and mild. Yeah, the word in the Greek for the New Testament is phobos, from which we get the words phobia. And they, it, it's like with your parents. When you're doing well, you respect them. When you're not doing well, you fear them, right? All right. Now, our worship about the Lord is centered around the altar. Verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. So you're not going to try to even make a, a, re a replication of me and make that your altar. But I have no problem with an altar, a place. An altar is a place to meet God. We have an altar. I, I don't have it. My wife has an altar in her house. It's her easy chair. She gets into that easy chair after her cup of coffee and she prays and she studies the word out loud. And every kid going to work, every kid going to school has to go by that chair and she's at the altar. And uh, she's not rude, but we've learned not to interrupt her. And uh, we just, just let her be by herself. And this is her altar. Well, what kind of an altar? Now, with me, my altar is my feet. I walk with my dogs and take my altar all around the area in the woods. So that's my altar. But wherever it is, you've got a place where you meet God. An altar of earth, verse 24, you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it burnt offerings and peace offerings, your sheep, your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. That's going to be the place where you make animal sacrifices, shedding blood to cover your sins, looking forward to my son who will bear your sins and his blood will not cover but remove. So what is an altar? It's a place where you meet God and that place is not really a chair. 
in Kelly's illustration or the, the woods, that place is Jesus Christ. That's the altar. With all of these things we're looking at here, think about Jesus. It'll make it much simpler, much richer. Jesus becomes the altar where we meet God. Jesus is where the animal sacrifice becomes fulfilled. Their blood no longer uh, being shed. His blood was sufficient. Now, verse 25, this is important. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. What is hewn stone? Chiseled, chopped, whatever. So I want you to make, make it natural. Don't add your efforts to my effort. The altar represents my son carrying your sins, shedding his blood for you. Don't you try to add to it. And the church has done that in so many ways. Even in communion, where we take the bread and don't see it as a symbol or representation of the body, but say it's literally the body of Jesus Christ. That's taking the work of Jesus and adding to it. Or they take the cup and they say, instead of it representing the blood of Jesus, it is literally the blood, and when I partake of it, I'm completing the work of Jesus. That is heresy. That is heresy. There's nothing that you and I can do or need to do to add to the work of God. It's complete. Let's try another example here. God says, I want you to go, and I want you to lay hands on the sick to see them recover. And so you take your oil and you go and say, may I pray for you? And you say yes. And so all of a sudden you anoint with oil and then you think, I'm going to liven things up a bit. In the name of Jesus, I command. I command that spirit to go. I do. The next thing you know, I'm adding to the work of Jesus Christ. I'm adding to the work of God. I did that one time. I uh, was, a, was a drama major in college, and I always enjoyed the theater. And early on in our ministry, we had communion, and it was very powerful. The Holy Spirit really showed up. People were beginning to cry. And that got me excited. I thought, I'm going to add a little drama to it. And so I began to add some drama. I want to tell you, everybody in that room was impressed, except God. And he got a hold of me as I was driving home on Route 32, and he said, don't you ever, ever do that again. My son is sufficient for them. The Holy Spirit is sufficient to bring forth the emotions that I want. Don't you be theatrical. Don't you be histrionic. Don't you add to my work. So uh, that goes in any other way too. I'm doing a work for God, and God says, do this, and I think I'm going to add that. Don't add that. Lord, what do you want me to do? Leave it at that. So... The other thing is, be modest in the pulpit, verse 26. Nor shall you go up uh, by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. So they were not to have their short, uh, uh, the, uh, their short skirts, if you will, with their legs exposed. You wear the long robe. People in the, who are serving are not to be uh, improperly dressed. I hate to be critical. Maybe I'm a little jealous, but these young fellows in some of these mega churches, I've seen them, they go and they get pumped up and they have muscles like I dreamt of and they wear the tightest t-shirts and they wear jeans on a Sunday morning and they're flexing their muscles and they're looking gorgeous and they all got short hair the way I do here, but a lot more of it. And I don't see Jesus, but I say, my, look at those pecs. Look at those muscles. It's not right. We should get our eyes on Jesus. And for the ladies, modest dress, obviously. So uh, anyway, uh, but, but more than that, uh, let's, let's see Jesus. Let's see Jesus. Well, when you and I are serving him, let's not put our own big personality in it. Be pleasant, be nice, but let's see Jesus in all of that. All right, chapter 21. Let's get into some examples. We're not having new laws that are different from the Ten Commandments. We're just expanding them now. These are laws concerning injury, uh, because we need to know how to apply God's Ten Commandments to our daily living. And that's all law school is, is just learning the laws of the state and the country to apply to daily living. Now, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. Here are, my, here are the examples. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. 
So this is the beginning of bankruptcy law. If you're in debt, you can sell yourself into slavery. But if you are a fellow Hebrew, then uh, you are set free. The debt is canceled. You'll get more specific in Deuteronomy and indicate that any indebtedness is forgiven after six years. When I was in the practice of law, our firm specialized in bankruptcy law. I didn't know it at that time until I became born again, but that's where bankruptcy law originated. And bankruptcy law is based, uh, as far as complete forgiveness, chapter 7, on a seven-year basis. You are forgiven for your debts, and you cannot file for bankruptcy again for six more years. Every seventh year, and you wouldn't want to do it every seventh year, uh, but uh, for those that find themselves in difficult straits, they're entitled to file bankruptcy. It's a Christian option. It's, it comes from God because sometimes we need a fresh start. I, I've heard Christian teachers go against bankruptcy. They're going against God's word. Nobody wants to declare bankruptcy. Nobody wants to stiff creditors. But when you are in over your head and there's no way out, God gives you a new beginning. You take it and hopefully never have to do it again. But uh, it's every six years and then you let them go out free. Verse 3 Here's the, here's the rub. If he comes in by himself, he's a single man, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. That makes sense. But now it gets more complicated. If his master has given him a wife, probably a fellow servant, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters. And he shall go out by himself. So you come in single, and your master gives you a female slave to marry, and you marry her, and you have children, you cannot take them with you. They belong to the master. You've got to stay or leave without them. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. So I want to stay because I love my family. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So he will stay in that family, he will have his earlobe pierced, like the ladies do with their earrings, and uh, he, is, he then will become what they call a bond servant. I voluntarily, out of love, stay with my master forever. Every one of the New Testament writers, Peter, James, uh, John, Paul, identify themselves, even Jude. They don't say friend of Jesus, brother of Jesus. They say a bondservant of Jesus Christ. If you love the Lord, you are a bondservant. You have, in effect, gone to the doorpost and had your ear pierced and said, I serve my Lord Jesus voluntarily forever. And that's a beautiful picture there of voluntary service. And that uh, is also borne out by the Lord in one of the Psalms where it says regarding Jesus that he has opened his ear. The Father has opened the ear of the Son. Jesus becomes the bondservant, serving the Father out of love for free. So next time you think about it, say, Lord, I'm delighted to be a bondservant. And... Uh, I'm not sure I want to wear an earring in my ear to, to show that. I'm not sure my wife would want me to do that. In any event, um, have your ear pierced, metaphorically speaking. All right, if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, uh, who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. So this is her protection. The master is, wants to marry her, um, yeah, they're engaged, um, he changes his mind, uh, he can't do that. If he changes his mind, he shall let her uh, be redeemed, he shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. If he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters, treat her like a daughter. If he takes another wife... He shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. If he does not do these, th these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. You can't take advantage of her because she's a female. No society 
treats women any better than a true operating Christian society. You don't believe it? Get on the internet and Google some of the Islamic countries and see how women are treated there. All right, more examples. Verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, and that was accidental, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. So if it was intentional death, here's the death penalty. But if it was accidental, there's a chance for you to flee, a chance for you to be safe. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So premeditation, punishable by death. He who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. So kidnapping had a capital offense at that time. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And some states have even had that kidnapping uh, death penalty uh, at times. A quick story here, a little window of opportunity. That relationship with my natural father was, was bad. He kidnapped me once and I escaped. He kidnapped me twice and I tried to get out in Washington, D.C. He stuck me in a military school uh, on the western part of the state in Nashville, near Nashville. One night, my mother came down with my stepdad. They flew in the cover of darkness and mother said, I'm going to, we're going to come and get you. The penalty of their being caught was in Tennessee in 1950, guess what? Death penalty. Mother came down under the death penalty. Well, the next day, they, I was taken back by my natural father. I was kidnapped again, this time my mother and dad, my stepdad, uh, back here. So uh, that's another story. Kidnapped three times. How, how, what, what fun was that? Huh? In any event, uh, verse 18, if men contend with each other, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die, but is confined to his bed. If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. Now these laws are being applied every day all over the world, whether it's uh, through accidents, workman's comp, all kinds of things. So practical ways of working out love. Keep your eye on the ball. It's love. Loving God, loving your neighbor. But what happens when there's a lack of love and how do you deal with it? All right, verse 20. We're talking about lack of love. If a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his property. That's kind of hard for us to understand, but that was the laws of those times, and God dealt with the laws of society at that time of there being property. It doesn't mean that he was for it, but it was a, it was a benevolent law compared to the heathen laws of that time. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine." So if she and the fetus survive, then the husband decides what the punishment is, and that's going to be it. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Any harm follows, what does that mean? The mother is killed? The fetus is killed? Is this the first indication here of God's attitude about abortion? Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That seems harsh. But in the context of that time, there was no restriction. This is a benevolent law. Eye for eye means if your eye is taken out, you can only take the eye. In those days, you could take the head of the individual and five neighbors and friends as well. So it's a limitation. Thank God we have Jesus coming in the New Testament with his mercy and with his love. If a man strikes the eye of a male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. 
If he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. So this is love in operation, in practical daily living. What about with animals? If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox it tended to thrust with its horn in times past, it's not its first case, it has been made known to his owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it's killed a man or a woman, then the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. So pretty severe laws. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life whatever is imposed on him. So there's the redemption. Instead of killing the owner, he pays money and his life is spared. Again, this reminds us of Jesus Christ. You and I deserve death. That's the punishment for sin. But Jesus redeems us and has paid the price in our place. Whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. If the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Jesus was sold by Judas 1,500 years later for 30 pieces of silver. The mere price of a slave for our salvation. Verse 33, if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox, divide the money from it, and the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it's known that the ox tended to thrust in time past, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. So practical laws of working out love and relationships towards servants, towards animals, uh, towards personal injury. Then finally, chapter 22, God gives laws about morality. First of all, dealing with property for verses 1 to 15. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. There's a deterrent for stealing. You've got to pay back many times over. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So the thief breaks in at night and you kill him. It's justifiable. Is this ancient history? It's in the news every couple of weeks. Every couple of weeks this, this happens. At night, you're presumed to be able to defend yourself even to the point of killing. But during the daytime, you have options. You can flee, you can do something else. It says, so God is working on some very practical things which happen even to this day. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it's an ox or a donkey or a sheep, He'll, be, he'll restore double. Verse 5, if a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Makes sense. If a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it's stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. So, you give me money to hold, and a thief takes it, then we get the thief, he pays double. Can't find the thief. Jerry, I gave you some money to hold for me. And I say, I don't know what happened to it. I didn't take it. We go to the court, and the judge has to decide. And incidentally, having been in the civil law practice, uh, I'll tell you, we never hear about God in law school, nor hardly ever about God in the case law, but it's all over. It's, it's all of this in the laws of the land. And not just our country, but other countries as well, especially uh, European countries. 
Verse 9, if any, for any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. And by the way, who were the judges? Appointed by Moses, they would be elders. And what was the casebook law? Not New York State, not Supreme Court of the United States, not the World Court, the Bible. The Bible, this was their Bible. That's why they needed these laws. And so uh, for us, we're going through them to see amplifications of love, but these judges would look to see a particular case. Now, this is what happened. There was a thief, there was an ox, there was a servant, there was a tooth, uh, whatever. What do we have for precedent? That's the legal term, precedent. What was decided before, or in this case, what did God decide? God is giving precedent here on how to handle daily matters. He goes on to say here, verse 10, if a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or an animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, he shall not make it good. But if in fact it's stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner. It is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, he shall not make good what was torn. That was a law which David talked about later on, 500 years later. David was a shepherd as a young fella. The law of shepherding was that if you had sheep and an animal, a beast came and killed one of them, you did not have to pay for that lost sheep, but you had to cut off its ear or its paw and bring it back to say, this is all that was left. The animal had done it. I could not help myself, and you don't have to pay for it. David said, I never required payment for any animal that I lost. In fact, I fought with the bear, fought with the lion, what have you. And so these became very practical. So in, the, in all of Israel, all the time of David, uh, they would go to these laws to see what does God say? What's the precedent? Verse 14, if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If its owner was with it, he shall not make it good. If it, if it was hired, uh, it came for hire. Uh, now, moral and ceremonial principles, look at verse 16. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. Okay, so the premarital sex, he's got to pay the bride price and marry her. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. He pays anyway. Verse 18, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. What's a sorceress? Whoa, putting a sorceress to death. Well, I can take you up Central Avenue and show you a couple of houses or two of palm readers. And there was a nice lady down in, um, in Albany that uh, was a fortune teller. I went to her once, it was last week, I think. No, <laughs> before I knew the Lord, long before I knew the Lord. And uh, what's the problem with a sorceress? It's just a nice way of making a living, isn't it? I walked in to see her and she asked for my watch. I gave her my watch, she held my watch and she said, you have a sister who lives in San Francisco and she's a nurse and her name is Susan. I said, yeah, that's right. Gave me a few more facts, and she goes right on. Now, here's what's going to happen in the future. And she began to tell me the future, which never came to pass. How did she know that? She was dealing with demonic spirits. This was not loving God. You will have no other gods before me. She was in Albany, contacting a demon spirit in Chicago, who then relayed that to Denver, who relayed that out to San Francisco, however they operate. She was working with demon spirits. That's why we don't go and look at the fortunes. And we used to, Mother and I used to look at the fortunes in the newspaper, you know, look at your sign and all that stuff. Don't do that. Why? It's fake? No, it's not fake. It's real. It's having another God besides the living God. You, you want answers? You go to the Holy Spirit and ask Him. 
what he says about it. All right. Verse 19, whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. What is that all about? And that's not just uh, sex in the barnyard. That was a way of worshiping pagan gods at that time. They would actually lay with prostitutes, male and female, and animals, and pay the price because, again, you're not loving God, you're going to another God and serving that God by having animal sex at the altar of that so-called God. He who sacrifices to any God except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. You see how it's all very simple? It's all just loving God and loving your neighbor or not loving God and your neighbor. You shall not mistreat a stranger, nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, a loving neighbor. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. So again, loving God, loving fellow man. If you lend money to any one of the people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. When we first got this building uh, going through renovation, it was quite expensive, and we offered people in the church a chance to, uh, to invest in it. And instead of going to the bank for a loan, and my father was one of the people who had uh, loaned uh, a substantial amount of money to it, and... Uh, we found out what the prevailing interest rate was in the banks at that time, and we offered that interest rate to these participants, and we paid it until Dad read this one day. And he said, cancel my interest. Just pay back the principal. And so that was his law and understanding of it, and he sure didn't die broke. So uh, this was the idea of, uh, of not having to charge interest. It doesn't mean for the commercial world, that they won't buy that. Tell your banker to, to read this verse and see if he'll go along with it. If he does, let me know who your banker is. I'll, I'll be right there behind you to borrow money. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. All he has to offer as a pledge against that money is his coat. Don't you keep it overnight. That's his cover. That's all he has against the cold night air. It's his only covering. It's his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. God cares about us. He wants us to love him, and he wants us to love our fellow neighbor, and he's telling us exactly how to do it. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to... Now look at that. First of all, verse 28, don't revile God. Don't speak against God. Don't complain. And don't curse your ruler. Don't curse the president, the governor, the mayor, the uh, city dog catcher, whatever. You might not agree with them. What's the remedy? Pray for them. You want to write emails and letters? They'll never get there, but go for it. But do not curse. Pray. You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices. So give God the first. He wants to be first. That's why we worship on Sunday, first day of the week. That's why we give our tithe, the first tenth of our income. We give God the first tenth of our day as far as opening up, celebrating Him and worship and praise. Give Him the first chance to make a decision in your life. Instead of going to friends and ask, what should I do? Or Googling what the world does, go to God and ask Him what to do. You shall not delay to offer the first. He wants to be first. The first of your ripe produce, your juices, the firstborn of your sons, you shall give to me. Likewise, you shall do with your oxen, your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days, notice the compassion, and on the eighth day you'll give it to me. And you shall be holy men to me. You shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs because it has blood in it, and you're not to eat the blood because that represents life. He'll talk more about that. So that's the Ten Commandments with some good common illustrations. Loving God, loving man, or as the Beatles said, all you need is love. Remember that? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this study. We're excited about what's going to happen as we continue with this study of laws uh, and learning how to live by them. Love you, love fellow man. We can't go wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. moment your needs to say.